one of my favorite professors. His name was Professor Bill Todd. He was a professor of the practice. Bill Todd. Bill Todd's the man. And that, like... It sounds like he would be the man. Canonically, no. He did all of the healthcare work. I took all of his healthcare classes. I did a practicum with him where we basically did a mini consulting project with uh, CHOA, which is the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and gave them some recommendations on their path forward on a specific question. And I loved it. I guess that makes sense why I then went into consulting because I was like, oh, I did this mini consulting project. I don't think I ever put that together. But, um, but yeah, that was... Bill Todd was a formative professor in my time at Georgia Tech. And then when I started at Deloitte, I met some of the most wonderful human beings who worked in the healthcare space, who worked in the social determinants of health domain, people who were thinking about climate and health, people who were thinking about underserved communities, people who were asking fascinating questions. And so I really prioritized my career and kind of when we talk about consulting, you have to like network your way onto projects and you have to really focus on building your community there. I really focused on building my community in the healthcare group. And just the people who poured into me, my managers, some of the partners I worked for, the people who wrote my recommendations for grad school, people I still keep in touch with, they really shaped my perspectives and challenged me to think deeper about the topics I was interested in. Hi, my name is Courtney Burton. I'm a member of the 2022 cohort and a second year at the Graduate School of Business, as well as getting a joint master's in environment and resources through the EIPER program. I imagine a world where healthy aging is not a privilege, but an undeniable right. Welcome to the Imagine a World podcast from Knight Hennessy Scholars. We are here to give you a glimpse into the Knight Hennessy Scholar community of graduate students spanning all seven Stanford schools, including business, education, engineering, humanities, law, medicine, and sustainability. In each episode, we talk with scholars about the world they imagine and what they are doing to bring it to life. Today, you'll be hearing from Courtney Burton, a joint MBA MS student. During our conversation, you'll hear Courtney's fascination with health spans discovering that she did not want to attend med school, building a diverse set of skills in healthcare, embracing her inner clown, and so much more. Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to another episode of the Imagine a World podcast. I'm your co-host, Willie Thompson. I am a MBA student, and as a Friday, also a master's degree student in the school of education. I found out I got in a Friday. Yay! 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 Really? We've been waiting Yay! to hear for weeks about yeah. yeah. Willie's acceptance yeah. to the program. Yeah. Congratulations. I'll be at school now. I'll have an extra yeah. year. Are yeah. you sticking around for a third year? Yes. So hey! Yay! Yay! Okay. Anyone who has heard the past few episodes has heard him say, oh, you know, hopefully... Mm. And then the ed school. Yeah. Don't hopefully. have to say hopefully. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fully it. actualized. So, you know, uh, heard it here live, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and I'm joined by my amazing, as always, co host, Taylor Goss. That's my voice. That was talking just <laughs> then. I'm Taylor. <laughs> All right. And as you heard from that, actually, let's just put our cards on the table here. Okay. We've heard the energy in the introduction, and that energy belongs to no one but the one, the only. Courtney Burton. Hello, Courtney. Welcome to the Imagine World Podcast. How are you doing? (laughs) Hi, friends. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's been a good week. It's been a good quarter. Things are both winding up and winding down. Wow. Yeah. I was telling Willie that I feel like I'm putting a bow on my quarter, but at the same time, I feel like the finale is happening where all of the fireworks are happening at once. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so trying to kind of just get my ducks in a row, figuring out who I owe what things to, (laughs) what deliverables to. What did I say that I would do? What did I say I was going to do solo versus in a group? And who are those group members? And do we have time on the calendar? Like just tactical things. What are my responsibilities to other human beings at this time? Exactly. And how can I fulfill them to the best of my ability? That's right. Little fireworks everywhere. What are some of the things that are on your mind right now as you wrap up the quarter? 
Biggest thing on my mind right now, I'm taking Design for Extreme Affordability, okay. which is the Big D School class. Okay. And we're working with a partner in Costa Rica called Biblioteca David Kitson. They're a community center that also serves as a library for the local community in Nosara, which is like a beach town on the west side of Costa Rica. Mm. I'm traveling there for spring break. Ooh. Oh, amazing. Yeah, which is super exciting and great and is like part of the program. Um, but there's a lot of things to do. Okay. I need to figure out who I'm interviewing on the ground, trying to get on their schedules, but also not being too structured mm -hmm. with how I'm planning the schedule. I don't know. For serendipity. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Leaving yeah. room for flexibility. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. So stream for, designing for stream affordability. So you got that class that's mm -hmm. wrapping up. Yeah. Um, you're telling us a hilarious story about another class. I don't know if you want to talk about that on the pod, but uh, I would love yeah, to. Yeah, uh, no, I'll, I can talk about okay. it. I'm in the climate tech for rapid decarbonization class and as part of like my EIPER program, but mm -hmm. it's technically sits within the business school. And we have a big paper that's due next Friday, I guess. And what's a big paper for the business school? A big showing? paper, it's just like a group paper. So it's a group of folks and we just all have to write in a cohesive voice together. And okay. sometimes that can be a challenge. Oh, it's always a challenge. Yeah. So that's due next Friday. Everyone has to do it. And we had to submit our outline to the professor yesterday. Okay. Writing it with two of my good friends. And we just submitted a pretty quick, simple outline to yes. say like, check, check, we got it done. And then the professor in class was like, hey, we're going to pick like the 10 best projects to present. <laughs> and we got an email like this morning or last night being like, congratulations, you were selected to present on Monday. Oh, Monday. When, a week from yesterday? Uh, yeah, a week from yesterday when the paper is due like next Friday. And so, so we you know have a, a paper and a presentation. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. You know, it's a privilege to learn so much. Yeah. <laughs> And you got a front. You have to know everything you're gonna write the paper earlier, so yes, you can give a, a coherent presentation. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I think there is space for improv in this presentation. Okay. Yeah. All right. right? Wow. And so we're well, well. And that brings us to something else that's happening. I have an improv show tonight as part of the R Chuckle Fellows. Tonight, okay. this very night. This very evening okay. at 8 p.m. Okay. in G101 in the Business School. <laughs> this was March 5th, 2024. Right, right, right. Do not show up at G101 <laughs> whenever this podcast airs. <laughs> Yeah, but really excited about that. We bought new lights. The theme of the show is wet and wild. So, you know, it'll be a great time. And what are the other features of this improv show? Tonight? Yeah, a lot of uh, short form improv games. Okay. So um, really excited about that. We're also going to do half of the show of long form games okay. in our favorite format. So the format we're using is, and this will be in the future, so people are have already seen the show. Yeah. But what we do is we do a Instagram interview. So one of the R Chucklers, they select someone from the audience. The person <laughs> opts into having their Instagram feed showed on screen. Oh, I remember and this. It's hilarious. Talk about what's happening in their Instagram. I had some doozies back in the day. Yeah. So just, just, just you know, running for for each state you know, state executive board or something like that. Love for it. You should, oh my God, you should see some of the posters, <laughs> that posters they made in, in not Photoshop, but probably like Windows Paint. Windows Paint, that yeah. takes me back. But yeah, so interview folks and then we use their stories as inspiration mm -hmm. for our long form improv. Oh, that's fun. It's so fun. It's so, so fun. But yeah, we have a new crop of MBA ones who are joining us for their first show and they're really jazzed. They're really excited. I got a WhatsApp that they were doing an MBA one only practice last night. Oh, and I was like, okay, improv wow. harmos. We love yeah. it. We love it. And want to make sure they're, they're presenting their best work to the audience. I, yeah. I feel that. That's great. Right. Yeah, but it'll be a good time. Yeah. That's amazing. And just real quickly, our chuckle is just in case. I don't know if we cover that, but just yeah. before our, it's clear. Our chuckle is the improv comedy troupe that's at the GSB, right. and it's a play off of Arbuckle, which oh. is like the Arbuckle Fellows is yes. like a leadership prestigious fellowship, yeah. and we're just like hee hee ha ha. We're the Our Chuckle Fellows. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, that's that's awesome, and I, I, I'm sure that we will pick up on the through line of what improv, you know, what where that where that comes up in your life and where that came from. But do you want to, you want to rewind it a little bit first? Yeah, for sure. So Courtney, before we talk to you about the world you imagine, you have this very, this very interesting imagine world statement that I think is very unique in this orientation, but we'll get to that. But let's talk about the world that you were born into okay. and the world that you've experienced thus far. Where are you from and what was your journey here to Stanford? Yeah, absolutely. So 
I was born in San Antonio, Texas. Both my parents were military, so I was born on an army base there. Mm. But I spent most of my life growing up right outside of Atlanta. Um, ATL, we we love it. Um, uh, oh, uh, hot uh, Atlanta. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I grew up in Atlanta. I love Atlanta so much. I feel such a deep connection to the city. So I grew up in the suburbs. My family were really close, unit of four, my mom and my dad. My older sister, Jazz, she was two and a half years older than me. She was a senior when I was a freshman in both high school and college. I would say she's my best friend. She is incredible. We went to the same college. We both went to Georgia Tech. Go Jackets, Stingham. I studied operations and supply chain and the Scheller College of Business, and we called it the College of Happiness. And it was the happiest place on the Georgia Tech campus. Without a hint of irony? Without a hint of irony. I loved Scheller. I was a Scheller student ambassador. I would have like donut events in the atrium. I loved Scheller so much. I love the synergy. Yeah. We had this whole like hashtag. It was like Shellebrate. Yeah. <laughs> I was really big into school spirit, which I mean- okay. Reminds us of. I think you're just in the spirit period. I think that's the spirit. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. I She's guess. In the spirit, and she has the spirit. I mean, that was like the most spirited intro to the podcast <laughs> yeah. of the season. So you yeah. have to count that, right? You know, I'm feeding off of y'all's spirit. Oh, yeah, wow. we're Thank giving you. and receiving at the same okay. time. But yeah, love Georgia Tech. Love my time there. I decided to stay in Atlanta after I graduated and started my career at Deloitte Consulting. Um, was always interested in the healthcare space. I was one of the kids who, growing up, I was like, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Like, just very, very focused, very yeah. serious about being a physician. Very specific, too. Very specific. I was really into bones. Um, <laughs> like, growing up, I went to a lot of summer camps, and one of my favorite summer camps was a med school summer camp. So I oh, pert- what? I cosplayed as a med student at the GW Medical School for a summer before my junior year of high school. Okay. I was very focused. I was a very focused child in that regard. But when I got to college, I realized I didn't love blood mm. okay. and I also despised chemistry. And so I was like, you kind of need to be able to do both of those things if you're going to be a surgeon. Um, you and so important. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So pivoted a little bit. My family is a big healthcare family. So I was saying, like, how can I still be in the healthcare space okay. while not being a physician or a surgeon, you know? Mm-hmm. I went into consulting, mm-hmm. <laughs> as one does. Really? Yeah. Hey, <laughs> what you know about that? I know a little bit, you know. You know what? Consulting is the best place when you for two things. When you don't know what you want to do next. Heard. And when you need to find another job. Mm-hmm. Those are two places that are primed for those two things, yes. I believe. Yeah. And, I mean, I always thought about it through the lens of, like, I was a college kid and I was like, I don't know what I want to do, like what you said. But I also like didn't really want to grow up. And I felt like consulting was a way to like Peter Pan it a a little bit. Peter Peter Pan Pan it. Yeah. Yeah. I I use that expression a lot. I I see you. I I see you. I was like, I feel like I can try a bunch of different things. I can basically have a bunch of different careers just like under one umbrella. But I got there and I was like, I'm going to be a healthcare girly at Deloitte. But yeah, I was working a lot in the healthcare system space, okay. um, mm-hmm. working with a lot of hospitals. And in that exploration, I really got interested in the social determinants of health. Mm-hmm. So that is the 80% of the environmental, social, economic aspects beyond yeah. healthcare services that impact health and well being for populations. Mm-hmm. So started doing more work in the SDOH space. That's social determinants of health. Just Thank you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna have a glossary at the end. I realize I speak in alphabet soup, so I will try to you know nail that down. Thank you so much. I uh, was working in the SDOH space, loved it, and then started working more so in the health equity space because it just kind of made sense. Yep. Um, one of my favorite things that I did at Deloitte is I was on the team that built and launched the Health Equity Institute, which is their uh, social innovation hub that focuses on pro bono work and collaborations across the health ecosystem. So loved that, did that for a few years, and then decided it's time for change. So what happens when you still don't want to grow up and you want change? You go back to school. You go to grad school. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. So I uh, decided decided I wanted to get my MBA and really explore what does healthcare innovation leadership look like for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so applied to Stanford, applied to Knight Hennessy. And if I can be very honest, I applied to both the GSB and Knight Hennessy through the lens of 
what's the worst that could happen, right? Like the worst thing that yeah. they can say is no. Right, exactly. I yeah. did not- Because it's such a moonshot. Yeah, I, I did not feel qualified, right? right? Yeah. I might as well try, like say yes to yes. Yeah. And I clicked submit and uh, now yes I'm and here. Improv. Yes, uh, and it's all about to improv. <laughs> but yeah, now at the GSB, I added my EI per second degree to really focus on that environmental aspect that impacts health and well being. And so through EI is, is that what most people do with, with EI is add like a environment and sustainability um, angle to, to something entrepreneurship related? Some do, right? So in order to do the joint MS, you already have to be on campus. It's either like business students, law students, folks in policy school. Mm -hmm. They're all applying for that second degree. A lot of folks focus on like hard tech or like decarb things. I'm more so in the human system side of things. Um, my concentration human is- Human and planetary health. Human and planetary health. Planetary you know health. it, Wally. Yeah, do our research over here. Yeah, I love I love that combination of terms, human and planetary health. Mm -hmm. It confuses a lot of people. Um, <laughs> like, for instance, my sister was telling one of her friends that I was doing human and planetary health, and her response was, I didn't know Courtney had such interest in the solar system, right. which is fair, which is so <laughs> fair. So I, I try to frame it around, like, climate and health. Mm -hmm. um, and then the longevity aspect is I, like, through the lens of social determinants, through the lens of – health equity, I think about how can people be supported as they age. Mm -hmm. And so I've started looking into the lens of expanding health span, which is the number of years we have as healthy folks. Right. As opposed to lifespan, which as is just the number of years. Span, yeah. Which is the number of years. Yeah. yeah. So in a swirly twirly way, that is a little bit about me, where I came from and how I got here. Wow. Hardly swirly twirly. You've laid out a path <laughs> for us. There's so many questions. I think... I would like to step back a little bit. And you said you came from a healthcare family. Yes. How did they think about you also going into healthcare and your choice to not be a physician? And, you know, how did their perspective affect yours? And then who did you meet along the way Ooh, that yeah. changed your perspective mm -hmm. additionally? Okay. So backing it all the way up. Yeah. My mom is an ENT, so your nose and throat surgeon. She did that in the army, and then she built her private practice when I was a kid. So I grew up going to her her clinic all the time. My sister has a master's in public health, and my dad is healthcare adjacent because he ran my mom's practice. Uh, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Nice. Um, and so when I say I come from a healthcare family, like everyone touched health in some way. It's yeah. a family affair, dude. It's a great Mary J. Blas song. Hey. Mm -hmm. um, and Sly Stone song. Oh, you're <laughs> right. Excuse me. Yeah. You know, okay. Fact yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not French. You know what's... Anyway, that's according. <laughs> oh, no. I love it. Um, when you asked about their feelings when I didn't become or didn't mm -hmm. pursue med school, yeah. my mom was never, like, pro me going to med school. Okay. Like, okay. I was kind of the one being like, I want to be a physician. Like, I I see you doing this. You love your work. Like, I want to love my work. I want to help people. Like, this seems like a good fit. And upon reflection, she always told me, she's like, Courtney, you don't love chemistry. Like, <laughs> Courtney, like, you've never liked chemistry. You don't want to do this. She's like, I think you want to want to do this, yeah. but you don't. And so when I finally made the choice to, you know, pursue more of a business path. She was like, yeah, I think that this fits. Like okay. she, she was always very supportive of me doing things that fit well within my realm of intrigue. That's what I call it. Like different things that I'm excited about. My sister has always been my cheerleader. So she was always like, sweet, do what you think is right. And my dad just, he's happy when I'm happy. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the family folks I met along the way. Met a lot of folks in Scheller, actually. One of my favorite professors, his name was Professor Bill Todd. He was a professor of the practice. Bill Todd. Bill Todd's the man. And that, yeah, like... Sounds like he would be the man. Canonically uh, known. Canonically, canonically known. Whoa. In Scheller. Yeah. Wow. He did all of the healthcare work. I took all of his healthcare classes. I did a practicum with him where we basically did a mini consulting project with... Uh, CHOA, which is the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and gave them some recommendations on their path forward on a specific question. I guess that makes sense why I then went into consulting because I was like, oh, I did this mini consulting project. I don't think I ever put that together. But yeah, Bill Todd was a formative professor in my time at Georgia Tech. And then when I started at Deloitte, I 
met some of the most wonderful human beings who worked in the healthcare space, who worked in the social determinants of health domain, people who were thinking about climate and health, people mm-hmm. who were thinking about underserved communities, people who were asking fascinating questions. And so I really prioritized my career and kind of when we talk about consulting, you have to like network your way onto projects and you have to really focus on building your community there. I really focused on building my community in the healthcare group. And just the people who poured into me, my managers, some of the partners I worked for, the people who wrote my recommendations for grad school, people I still keep in touch with, they really shaped my perspectives and challenged me to think deeper about the topics I was interested in. Amazing. And you're sort of laying this naturally as the next point, but how do you think about your imaginal world statement in reflection of this interest in like healthcare and health span? Because we are all, by I think objective measures, young people. And for a lot of people of our age, well, maybe actually I'll speak to the business school real quick. Taylor, yeah. I know, but a lot of our classmates have to deal with the reality they are getting older, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the number of Injuries that happen to, oh my to, goodness. to business school students, probably as a share of injuries amongst other grad school students, is probably pretty high. Torn wow. ACLs everywhere. Everywhere. Torn ACLs. Someone else had like a, a fractured shoulder, apparently, mm-hmm. from playing two minutes of basketball. Mm-hmm. So Why did I immediately imagine basketball related? <laughs> <laughs> really did. It's funny. Most of the ones I know are basketball and skiing, which okay. I think also oh. is emblematic of basket school. But, you know, it's something that we don't really think a lot about as young people. You know, I can count on my hand the number of times I have been like, oh, I'm getting older. One being when I was off my parents' health insurance. It's like, oh, I need my own health there insurance now. That's yeah. the thing. Um, when these sort of injuries happen to people that you know who are of similar age. And it's sort of this afterthought almost to think about what does it mean to live a healthy life throughout one's life. And so and can you speak to more of that in the way that your imaginal world statement came to be? Absolutely. There's a lot of different threads. So maybe I'll pull on the family thread first. Okay. So was always really close with my grandparents. On both sides. On both sides. Okay. And so kind of watching them age, I don't think I necessarily like put together the like healthcare interests with the healthy aging interests, but seeing a lot of the challenges that they had growing up kind of stuck with me. Mm-hmm. So thinking about my grandparents, thinking about my parents now, mm-hmm. watching them age, thinking about the different considerations around just like everyday activities. Mm -hmm. Married with some of my work within the Health Equity Institute when I was working at Deloitte, when I was thinking about underserved populations, Mm -hmm. was really focused on like women's health. And then as it relates to like women as they age. And I feel like that is a segment that no one talks about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And going back to Taylor, your question of folks who inspired me, I had a lot of mentors, like a few in particular, who focused on like menopause, osteoporosis, a lot of the health conditions that disproportionately impact women Mm -hmm. as they age, right? right? And I kind of kept that top of mind, was always like interested in this cohort and also at a fundamental level. But I kind of feel like I was born to be like 67 years old. Like an old soul? Old soul. I don't know if I call myself an old soul, but I- uh, But do other people? (laughs) I've heard it once or twice, right? Yeah. (laughs) I feel like I was born to be like 67 years old. When my parents like retired, I was like, wow, retirement looks great. Like (laughs) I was born to be a retiree. That's great. Um, All of those things. And then last spring, I took a longevity class within the business school. It was taught by one of the healthcare professors here in partnership with the Center on Longevity that sits at Stanford. Okay. Was fascinated by this class. We had so many interesting speakers, folks focusing on the startup space, people in incumbent organizations in the healthcare domain and beyond. And then the last piece that really clicked everything together was my internship last summer. I was in Mexico City. It was incredible. I was there all summer working at a seed stage startup that was focused on older adult health, reimagining what health insurance and preventative care looks like for folks in Mexico. I was put on it, building an osteoporosis education and fall prevention product. I loved it. I loved the stories. I 
the space felt right. Mm. When I'm thinking about like what's next, like as I'm in business school, as I'm thinking about my future, I was like, I want to stay within the healthcare domain, health girlies for life. Yes. I want to still touch social determinants. I'm interested on the impact of like our warming climate mm. on older adults. The yeah. Climate. So, warming? Yeah, this, this year planet, it is warming. Um, and so there are all well, these- Well, he's going to the ed school, folks. <laughs> I'm trying to think through how I can like braid all of these interests together. And when it like percolates up, it, it came to be into my imaginal world statement. So high level, long story short, I guess, that's yeah. kind of all the influences that impacted that statement. Okay, that's really beautiful. You know, I know that just scrolling through your Medium page, you have sort of a suite of writings on yeah. aging and health. What's your relationship with writing? Mm. What was the origin of the medium? And what does the writing mean for you or for the audience that you're writing for? I started writing those posts this summer. I felt like I was learning so much mm. so quickly, and I like didn't know where to put it. Right. And I was like, where do I put all this information that I'm gathering? You needed a medium. There you go. I mean, I guess. I mean, part of it is like going back to my family, like yeah. my family's, they're all writers. Like right. my sister okay, writes okay. a bunch of blogs. Um, Your sister's active. My sister's active. Yeah. We love jazz. She's wonderful. Jazz is um, she is active on Medium. Mm -hmm. She contributed to a children's book that's coming yeah. out. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, on my, school board. She does everything and we love her. Um, <laughs> my mom right now is writing a children's book that I'm beta reading right now, which oh. is wonderful. And growing up, I always wrote in my journal. I was a writer growing up. And so it felt like a natural outlet to talk about what I'm learning. In terms of my audience, mm -hmm. if I can be really honest, I really didn't consider an audience when I wrote this. I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to write something for me yeah. that I can track what I'm learning in a way. Right. And if this is instructive or helpful for others, sweet. Yeah. And it turns out a lot of people read it, which is cool. <laughs> How do you think they found it? I hope that they found it interesting. The way that I framed it is like, I don't have all the answers. That is obvious. Right. Like I'm percolating sure. on a lot of different things right now. And I'm just trying to learn and discuss. And the framing of those blogs was through the lens of, here's what I'm learning. I want to share this. I want to process this. I want to ask additional questions that can spur additional thinking and conversation. And... People responded. People commented on my posts, not always in a positive way, but I mean, when you okay. put things in public, that kind of happens. Yeah, you're going to get feedback. Yeah. Like, for instance, going back to climate and our how our climate is um, warming, changing and warming, you know? As well um, as just learned. As well as just talking about, I wrote a blog about the impact of extreme heat. Scorching. On. Yes, exactly. right. That's what, made, that's what made me think about the blog. Scorching yeah. summers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, being Which from in the South, I mean. Being from Atlanta specifically, yes. we know. Hot Atlanta. Hot Atlanta. Atlanta. You know it well. I know it well. A lot of people comment and they're like, the climate is not actually changing. Like, it's actually not that hot outside. <laughs> actually, no. <laughs> There's a brisk breeze out today. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Which is also instructive for me. True. Sometimes I find myself, especially like here at Stanford, we might not all agree, but generally we buy into science or like people <laughs> right, I right, surround right. myself with, I guess <laughs> right. like I, we buy into science right, and yeah, right. it's sometimes helpful just to see like what other people are thinking and feeling. So yeah. it's been a really interesting exercise yeah. writing those blogs. And honestly, I need to get back to it. I think once I came back to campus, I kind of got swept up in the yeah. everyday right. activities, but i um, trying to make some space to do more reflection. Good term on that because, I mean, it really is reflection when it comes down to it. If you're writing it for yourself and using it to, like, organize your own thoughts, for me, that is, you know, sitting in my bedroom and, like, writing songs into a voice memo demo mm. kind of situation, you know? And whether I show them to people, whether or not I have organized my thoughts about my life and expressed them in some way and doing it through writing or through art or however it is, mm -hmm. is all just, like, you know, seems to be – one of the most productive ways that you can reflect, at least in my experience. Yeah, absolutely. And like, for instance, the Center of Longevity reached yeah. out to me. I did some research with them last fall, but yeah. they reached out to me early this winter and they're like, hey, we're throwing a healthy aging 50 plus conference yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. at the med school yep. in February. Do you want to be one of our moderators for a panel? Yeah. I said, Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Yes, and is what I said. Yes, and. <laughs> um, and I got to interview Kelly and Juliet Starrett, who are leaders in the mobility space. And I still need to write 
a blog about all I learned from them. Amazing. Fascinating people. They come from the fitness world. They come from working with elite athletes. Mm-hmm. And honestly, they were telling me in their reflection, they turned 50 and they were like, you know, everyone's an athlete. So like, how can we rethink or reframe a lot of our recommendations in a way that can be really accessible for everyday people? Yeah. We did a lot of exercises on stage during the conference that focused on mobility and balance, I was their like dummy on stage doing the exercises (laughs) and was deeply humbled by the fact that my balance is not great when my eyes are closed. Okay. And so I learned that I need to work on that. It's something you don't think about. And what they mentioned to me that really stuck with me is as you age, you want to practice these things. These are skills, especially as it relates to balance. Balance Mm -hmm. is so key. And The purpose of this exercise of balancing on one foot when your eyes are closed is because if you can't do that well, there is an indication that you might fall in the dark as Uh, you age. Right, 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 right. right. Okay. So I was like, you know, I need to start balancing more often. And so now in the morning and at night when I brush my teeth, I brush my teeth on one foot. Oh, (laughs) I like that with your eyes closed. closed? No, no, no. I keep my eyes open. I try to do my eyes closed things um, when there's nothing else around me. Okay, okay, cool. When there's not a negative to falling, you know. That's pretty cool. I I, I like the concept of everyone is an athlete. However, I do think that if you threw me a basketball, I could fairly quickly just prove it. Mm. Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's about broadening the aperture and and access. (laughs) 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 You know, to use another word, uh, to really access, I think it's it's all about language, right? And I feel like even when you talk about your writing or some of the stuff that you've done, like, you know, even Nike's try to do, well, they've done this like pretty well, I think, in terms of like making the idea of an athlete be more inclusive for people. Oh, for sure. I mean, Taylor, you play guitar. That's a lot of like dexterity going on there, (laughs) you know, Um, athletic dexterity. I actually want to take this maybe to another part of your life in that you mentioned healthy life, healthy aging being a right and not a privilege. Mm -hmm. What are the things that have precluded people from having access to those things? And what are some of the things that are giving you hope about people having access to these ideas and these opportunities more frequently and even earlier in their lives? Yeah, there's so much there. Maybe I'll start from like the educational aspect. Sure, that works too. Like I think that there's a big gap as it relates to like health literacy, Mm -hmm. as it relates to understanding like what is healthy for you. Like going back to what I was mentioning around balance, stability, Mm -hmm. et cetera. But an awareness is key. So when we think about health literacy, getting the word out about like healthy behaviors, when we think about changing behaviors, or even more expansively thinking about like language. Like I was having a conversation the other day around like ageism Mm -hmm. and how language has a lot of power and how ageism is the last like ism. Quote unquote mm-hmm. ism that is tolerated in our society. Sure. Or like more openly tolerated, I guess. Like that that could be debated. But like people are more freely ageist than they are of a few other isms. And the way that we talk about older folks frames like what's available for them or how they are able to move through the world. So as it relates to the economic aspect of like social determinants of health retirement, when we think about people staying in the workplace, mm-hmm. when we think about older adults in the workspace, there are a lot of like implications of ageism. And so that impacts people's ability to retire, their ability to stay economically viable, et cetera. And so things that I wish were different, I wish that people were less ageist. And I actually wrote about this in one of my blogs, is I feel like ageist language is baked into how we're socialized. Mm-hmm. And so even as I'm going on this journey in the healthy aging domain, I'm trying to retrain myself. Mm. And it's interesting, the biases that we hold around age, when we talk about like, oh, just like the old folks home Mm -hmm. and considering like, how do we frame when we talk about older adults and aging? And usually it's in a negative light. Right. And so it's how can we reframe our language and change hearts and minds as it relates to like, what does healthy aging mean as an opportunity and as a positive. And so that's something that I'm trying to do every day. And so for instance, there is a growing number of folks at the GSB that are interested in the longevity space and putting together like a WhatsApp so we can stay connected and talk about 
kind of like things that we're learning, the care economy, yeah. talking about like how people are building in the healthy aging space. And I'm always struck by like the language that we use. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When we talk about like elder care, like there's a lot of tension around using the word elder okay. in, in different communities and different groups. Like okay. I'm indigenous on my dad's side. And when we talk about like elder, there's like a lot of weight to right. that. Yeah. And yeah. there's like a cultural like norm and aspect to that. Would you characterize that mainly as, as a respectful weight? Yeah, it's a respectful weight. Like for instance, during powwows, like mm-hmm. I'm thinking about powwows because I went to the Stanford powwow yeah. last spring. It's the biggest student run powwow. It was, it's amazing. Like if you haven't been, I highly recommend it. The first thing you do at a powwow before like you dance, like as a, as a dancer before grand entry is like you introduce yourself to the elders. Mm -hmm. So just like, that's like a small example, but Mm -hmm. there is just a lot of respect for elders, but in a broader capacity using like elderly and Mm -hmm. saying kind of Mm -hmm. terms like that in a derogatory way kind of exacerbates thoughts around ageism. So I don't know. I wish that people were less ageist. I wish that Mm -hmm. we all started doing the work to like retrain how we speak about folks as they age. I was just watching this earlier today, so it comes to mind, but I wish that everyone would watch the video of Aretha Franklin at the Kennedy Center Honors Mm. event. It was during the Obama administration. She had the the fur on. She had the fur on. I know exactly what video you're talking about. Carol King was being honored and Carol King wrote, you make me feel like a natural woman. Mm. And Aretha comes out in all of her like grace and royalty and just kills it. Mm. And it's one of the coolest examples of someone who is late in their career, who is past what some would say is the prime of her career, and just gives this mind-blowing performance that can do nothing but knock away anybody in the vicinity. And you just get this sense of like, wow, she hasn't lost anything. There's so much lived experience that is fueling that performance and that fuels anyone who's had the blessing of having a long life. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It is incredible. It's interesting. In the longevity class, we always talked about like the reframe of like framing aging as an opportunity. And I always get really interesting reactions when I okay. tell people that I'm interested in the healthy aging space and yeah. I'm also getting a degree in sustainability. They're like, aren't yeah. those two things at odds? Interesting. Like, yeah. don't you not want people to live longer because that's bad for the planet? Yeah. And I think that's an interesting question. One, I respond talking about health span. Okay. It's mm-hmm. like, I'm yeah. not necessarily in the camp of everyone needs to live as long as possible. Sure. Like, I, I don't necessarily identify that way. I'm more so of like, how can we help people live in a healthy way yeah. where they can do the things that they want to do and they are like liberated for a longer amount of time? So I focus on the health span piece and then that connects into – the environment that connects into, like, for instance, I am looking to take a class in the door school next quarter that focuses on migration as mm-hmm. it relates to climate change, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Big topic in Louisiana it's with a, people moving away from the coast because of uh, sea level rise and wetland loss. As we think about like migration and who's able, yeah. mm-hmm. who's yeah. able to like get up and get out right. of a specific location. I think that's a fascinating point, but there's just so many different like threads within this domain that I'm interested in, that yeah. I'm interested in learning more about, talking to more people and doing more reflection myself. Like, as I mentioned, I don't know as much as I would like to know about this space, but I'm interested in like building my capacity there. So you mentioned where you're going to for spring break mm. and it's one of what, five blue zones? It I'm sure assuming. is. It's five, right? And first off, what are blue zones for folks who might not know? Okay. Can you talk a bit about... Like, how feasible is it to bring some of the learnings from places like Blue Zones to places like the U.S. or Palo Alto or maybe other places that are afflicted by either a confluence of, like, things that keep them from being able to live healthy, longer, healthy spans? Yeah. Or better healthy spans? I don't know. But what's the best way to say healthy span? Better, longer? Like health, Stronger? I don't know. Health span? Better health span? Longer health span? Stronger health span? Longer health span, longer I health guess. Span. Okay. I, I'm trying, um, trying to be mindful of my language. <laughs> Starting with blue zone. So what is a blue zone? Blue zones are areas in the world where folks tend to live much longer than average. Also, not everyone's on board with the concept of blue zones, which I've found interesting. Netflix will have you thinking totally differently. (laughs) Yeah, Netflix will have you thinking differently, but some people think that it's more of like a marketing ploy. Okay. Where I'm going in Costa Rica, it's one of the, the five blue zones. It's the only blue zone in Latin America. 
I'm really interested to learn more about the things that are underlying the cultural norms there that are impacting its ability to be a blue zone. Mm -hmm. I've done a few interviews with folks for the project, and I ask about the blue zone all the time, and I ask about, like, cultural norms and daily life. They talk about life being slow. They talk about, like, access to food. They're close to the coast. And they talk about, like, surfing. They talk about staying really active. They talk about how people, like, walk around. I mean, that was just, like, an example that they gave. Right, right, right. And so when we think about, like, blue zones – There's so many different aspects that impact an area's ability to sustain life for a longer amount of time. But I think the interesting question you asked of like, how can you take some learnings from blue zones into areas that are not? I don't know if like Mm. if you can, right? I think there's a mindset change that would need to happen, like behavior change as it relates to working together as a community. Like being communal versus individualistic, like that has an impact on blue zones or location, right? So if you're landlocked and you have less access to like maybe like food in a certain way, like that might impact your ability to, to be a blue zone. I don't know. I'm interested to learn more. I've been hearing bits and pieces from folks that I've been interviewing, but I'm excited to get out there and, and see what I find. Yeah. It'll be really interesting to see what, even to the point of not being able to Because I think even that around, like, having to take something from somewhere else and apply it somewhere else wholesale, short changes the notion of, like, even being able to, like, add color to a situation or to a community. And so instead of making places blue zones, you could just make them, like, bluer, right? And Mm. add color, right? Bluer. Uh, Bluer or more blue. Sorry, that might be bad grammar. (laughs) Great either way. (laughs) Something I'm curious to know, Mm -hmm. if you've thought about very deeply, what do you hope that your life will look like Mm -hmm. later in life? What do you envision for yourself? What does your healthy span look like? Yeah, 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 what what, what would you like your health span to look like? When I envision my life, maybe at 67, the age that I feel like I was born to be. That you were your soul soul age. Yeah. Yeah, I. Is it lame to just be like, I hope to be happy? I hope to be happy. Mm -hmm. I hope to still be active and be able to go on my walks. I love going on walks in my neighborhood. I. I love spending time with my family. I hope that I'm still able to spend time with my family, whether it's the family that I have right now or if I have kids at that point or a spouse or the family that I find through my friends and relationships. I don't know. I hope to be settled in a community that loves me and that I get to love through just interactions, through community giving. I hope that I'm retired at that point, that (laughs) I have full control over my calendar. I don't know. I hope that I've built something that has changed at least one life for the better. Mm. I don't know if that's like aiming too low, but that is like, I hope that I create positive change as it relates to the health innovation space, as it relates to the environment, as it relates to like different threads that I'm interested in my career. I don't know. I hope to do some good and I hope to be happy and I hope to love on people for as long as possible. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. As we are posting toward the finish line here, something that we do with every participant in the podcast is talk about a little bit about the Night Hennessy application. Yeah, absolutely. Briefly before we get there, could you talk a little bit about how the Night Hennessy community has impacted your experience at Stanford? Yeah. I've loved my time at Night Hennessy. I, as a student in the GSB, the GSB is a bit of a bubble. Okay. Oh, okay. And I feel like coming to Denning House allows me to learn more about what's happening on campus Mm -hmm. and in the world. The conversations that I have at the GSB are incredible, Mm -hmm. but they're super different than the conversations I have here. Mm -hmm. For instance, I have so many different conversations with our lawyer friends, like our friends in the law school about what they're doing, about clerkships, about impact of certain regulations mm. on very specific communities. Very specific. Yeah. And it's those are not conversations that I would have at the business school. And for instance, last spring, I went to Sierra Camp as yeah. part of the uh, the Night Hennessy retreats. Yeah. And Lovely space. It's gorgeous. I, I don't have the words. But was going on a walk with a few friends and was percolating on some ideas as it relates to 
my like e hyper application, yeah. I believe. Okay, okay. And they gave me incredible feedback. And they were like, okay, I'm actually a PhD in the door school. So let me tell you about some different programs that are happening in the door school and and, and supporting you in that way. Being in Hennessy House allowed me to get this joint master's right. in EIPER. Like, it has given me a lot of space mm-hmm. to explore a lot of my different passions, to yeah. meet different people. I was able to travel to Mongolia yeah. uh, last August. Would never have been able to go to Mongolia. Learned learned a ton. Made some beautiful friendships. Ate a ton of food. Mm. Learned an immense amount about dairy, yeah. specifically in Mongolia, through one of my friends in this program who focuses on food history as her PhD. Yeah, she's Amazing. incredible. She's fantastic. Incredible Jump human being. Yeah, we love Julia. Yes, come Shout on, Julia. Out. Julia yes. Fine. But yeah, I feel like Night Hennessy has really just made my experience at Stanford so much more colorful. Yeah, I was at a lunch with Julia and some other folks with John, maybe in our first quarter here, and she was explaining like the history of cheese, something like the history of cheese or something like that. Mm. And I've never been more fascinated about cheese when she was talking about the history of, I think it was cheese in that instance, but it's just so interesting to hear, you know, well, I think it's interesting to hear a lot of people who are experts or you know, yeah. right. adjacent expert on something, just like talk about it. And she loves talking about it. You can tell it's very animating. Oh, absolutely. So as we come up on the closing, as Taylor mentioned, another aspect that we'd like to talk about is your improbable facts. Mm. I think Taylor and I are aligned that that's probably the place where we spent the most of our mind share and time yeah. on how yeah. to frame those appropriately. And for you, what are some improbable facts about you that that you could share with us? I mean, we have a couple that we had thought of, and we'd like to hear from you first. Yeah, I feel like one of my favorite improbable facts was in my youth, I regularly attended clown camp. Oh, what? And I served as ringmaster during one of my performances. So that is such a fun fact. And I feel like I whip it out more than is appropriate, perhaps. <laughs> why, didn't, why didn't we start the podcast I know, with there? The clown, really. Oh, my God. Yeah. And honestly, I feel like there is such a through line at Stanford as – it relates to clowning and like, hear me out. <laughs> oh, no, 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 go for it. During go for our it. storytelling class first year in Night Hennessy, I loved the storytelling classes all around how you can tell really impactful stories. Shout out to Dan and Lisa. Lisa. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Lisa was actually talking about how she went to clown school. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that was one of my first conversations with Lisa. And I was like, I see you as a reformed clown. <laughs> I see you, Lisa. <laughs> Um, and then yeah, there's this, this is this is Dan Klein and Lisa Rowland for anybody yes, listening, yes. by the way. Yeah, exactly. And there is a class that I want to take next winter um, called Introduction Intro to Clown. Yes, really? yes, you I see was, it. Yes, I, I, was, I, was so, I was trying to take it last quarter, but I, I, the schedule didn't work out. But yeah. we might be in, we might be Intro to Clown together next year. You and we'll me finding around. our inner clown together. I love it. I love it. That like, was a great improbable did. fact. Oh uh, yeah, it was. It was a great improbable fact. Uh, anything else? Any others you want to share? Another improbable fact is when I was applying, I was taking beekeeping lessons. Oh, to Night Hennessy. When I was applying to Night Hennessy, I was taking beekeeping classes in Atlanta because I should have talked about this in my dream as like a 67 year old. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to keep bees. I want to have an apiary. Like I. But not yellow jackets. You don't want to keep yellow jackets. <sighs> not yellow jackets, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, no, I want to keep bees. And so I, I was trying to learn as much as possible about beekeeping. Um, it started with uh, an Airbnb experience that <laughs> my sister bought for me as a gift because we gift each other experiences. But yeah, that was one of my improbable facts as well. That's so cool. Such a point where it's Airbnb. Airbnb know, experience, right? bees. Yeah. All the bees. Oh there God. it is. <laughs> All the bees. <laughs> okay. Uh, Great. Great job. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm practicing for intro to the clown. I'm, right, just, for the right, right, right. I'm just getting ready. I just love all the, all these, all the, how improv keeps popping up in this, in this interview. Life it's fantastic. Is improv, yeah. Life is improv. Mm. Yes. And mm. for our clothes, mm-hmm. would you share any advice or insight or thoughts that you would have for someone that's considering applying for the Night Hennessy program? Yeah. I mentioned earlier mm-hmm. that I was, I was very nervous. I mm. I felt like I was out of my depth. Mm. And I'm sure I'm not alone in that feeling. Yeah. I'm raising my hand to the ceiling. Yeah. Right now. And I, I think something <laughs> thank you so much, Willie. You're um I feel like if I could do it over or like tell tell myself when mm. I was applying, 
that being myself is enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to write down the truth about who I am. I want to show different facets of myself. I want to create a story that is compelling and true to me, Mm -hmm. something that I'm proud of, but that's enough. And I feel like if I had taken more time and been a bit kinder to myself during the application process, I would have enjoyed it a lot more. Mm -hmm. And everyone here, we're just people. I remember looking at the profiles of the current Night Hennessy's. Oh, yeah. God. And yeah, yeah, core memory for me as well. Yeah, almost, yeah. almost not applying. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. intimidating. It's really intimidating. I almost didn't apply because I was like, that's not me. Yeah. And now it is Yeah, because I tried. And I just said yes to yes. Love it. Yes to yes. And I'll just say I had the pleasure of not meeting but seeing Courtney twice before ever meeting her in person. This is both at the admit weekend for GSB, which nice. we were both part of the virtual contingent. Because uh, mm. I think it was Omicron. That was when Omicron was going crazy. Yeah, yeah. And also for the Night Hennessy interviews, which I also noticed her her background, her brown, I think it was like a brown chair or something like that. It was, it was the same same background, but <laughs> it's striking. But you know, I will say even, you know, seeing Courtney in those environments, those aspects of not of maybe, maybe imposter syndrome or a lack of confidence never came through to me when I saw her engaging or talking to people. So I just want to say uh, to my friend that that, that, that is not what uh, was being displayed probably through a lot of like practice and sort of like maybe self-talk, but that definitely didn't come up. Yeah. People can be far more nervous or uncertain than they seem. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. 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 I did my power poses before that. Interview. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> well, they worked. Uh, and the second is, and I actually did this talking about the bios, I think it's something that we all relate to mm-hmm. in that, they can, I mean, maybe for some people they're, they're magnetized by that. But for me, well, I guess magnetism works on both ends. Like they're attracted to it. I'm very much repelled by it and like, mm-hmm. oh, maybe I won't do that. Mm-hmm. And I think Courtney's done a really good job, even in her bio, uh, you know, looking at it. It's like, it's great. And it's also like not over the top, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think the more we have folks, you know, like Courtney, you know, in our communities, I think the clearer eyed we can be about the people we are and the spaces we assume. So I just want to say, Thank you, Courtney, for being on this episode and for being such an embodiment of energy and spirit and, and and brilliance sort of in all the ways that you approach such an important topic. So I just want to thank you for being on the pod. Thank you and, for uh, having me. This is fun. Course. It's been yeah. such a pleasure. Yeah. It's been amazing. So we appreciate you and thank you for stopping by on Imagine World. Until right. next time. Until, Until next time. time. <laughs> right. Enjoy your improv tonight. I, know, I will, Enjoy our I chuckle. Will, I will. <laughs> I'll be all chuckling. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Imagine a World, where we hear from inspiring members of the KHS community who are making significant contributions in their respective fields, challenging the status quo, and pushing the boundaries of what is possible as they imagine the world they want to see. This podcast is sponsored by Knight Tennessee Scholars at Stanford University, a multidisciplinary, multicultural graduate fellowship program providing scholars with financial support to pursue graduate studies at Stanford while helping equip them to be visionary, courageous, and collaborative leaders who address complex challenges facing the world. Follow us on social media at Knight Hennessy and visit our website at kh.stanford.edu to learn more about the program and our community.